Welcome to Cycling Fashion Week, the only global podcast purely focused on cycling style, fashion, aesthetics, and culture. I'm your host, Alex, and I'm joined by my co-hosts, Warren and Tony. Cycling Fashion Week is brought to you by leclub.cc. Leclub.cc is your go-to destination, your one-stop shop for the hottest, the best, the most awesome premium cycling apparel that you can find on the internet and anywhere in the world. They've got brands like Map, The Service Course, Universal Colors, Quark Shoes, Sweet Protection Helmets. They've got Albion. They've got everything, the best brands in one shop. They have amazing coffee roasted in the beautiful city of Montreal. And if you use the code FASHIONWEEK15, you'll get 15% off your order courtesy of us, the good folks at Cycling Fashion Week. So check out leclub.cc for all your cycling fashion needs. They are the best, the greatest, and they will get you set up. Warren and Tony, how's it going this week? I'm rattled. I'm honestly, I'm rattled. We, Warren and I went for a ride on the weekend and uh, there's a, a girl who was, through a friend came and she is a, a Copenhagen local. She said she grew up in Copenhagen. She is a Dane, a, a classic Dane. And we noticed when she pulled up to meet us for the ride, she was wearing white socks with black shoes. And of course, I had to make a comment. For full transparency, this was a gravel ride. So I was wearing black shoes as well, but I was wearing black socks. And she said, the Danes never wear black socks. She didn't say anything about other colors, but never black socks. So the, even with the black shoes, the white socks, the reason I'm rattled is because I have had so much respect for the Danish people and they're just overall culture of design, everything, their buildings, their furniture, their bikes, all of it. They always had a perfect thing. And this to me is a huge misstep. The never black socks, it did not look right. I think that Alex is always correct with that one where it looks like a tap dancer. I'm kind of rattled by that because because the I put I put the Danish people very high in a pedestal of of fashion style and design. And that one kind of kind of hit me to the core a little bit that uh, apparently they'll never do black socks. They'll just wear white socks with black shoes. And then they, and then we had a muddy gravel ride that we were just basically covered in mud, proving once again that that gravel was sort of stupid. Yeah, so I'm kind of rattled today. To me, the most shocking part was how strongly she felt about being pro white socks and black shoes. It was pretty weird. To Tony's point, it rained a whole lot. You know, it was like a hundred k ride. It rained probably seventy five k of it. I hope she has bleach. She did not know about the podcast, or she didn't know she was she was riding with with experts like us. But I, we we did tell her pretty early on that we host the Cycling Fashion Podcast. And I wonder, I forget kind of like in the conversation whether that came up before the sock thing, and I think it did. And I wonder if she just like sometimes people just don't want to admit their mistake like maybe she knows she shouldn't have done that it was, you know she's 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 visiting from Copenhagen I assume she doesn't have like a ton of kit here maybe that was the only option and maybe she just thought you know what I'm not going to give in I'm not going to tell them I'm wrong and this is all I had and stuff I'm going to say that this is you know these guys aren't Danish they haven't spent a lot of time in Copenhagen in Denmark so they don't know I'm going to tell them that this is what the Danish people do so I don't know. I, I don't know. If she, she's truthful. I mean, well, we do have some Danish listeners. We know them. We'll have to get some info there. So, Tony, maybe the Danes need to to fall off your your pedestal here. I mean, sure. Great, great nation from the standpoint of design. Great cycling nation as well. I mean, they had Bjarne Ries and now, you know, Jonas Vingegaard, winner of the 2022 Tour de France, albeit on the ugliest kit in the peloton. I, I got to say that, although this has nothing to do with Denmark, it's more of a mishap on, on the Netherlands part. But uh, yeah, maybe the Danes need to fall off that pedestal. Now, speaking of other great European cycling nations. Do, do I replace it with the Italians? Funny you mentioned that, Tony, because I'm actually recording this podcast from a villa on top of a hill in Umbria, Italy, where I'm spending my vacation this summer. I, I like to summer on the Med in, in Italy. Uh, I was actually in, in Sardinia last week, enjoying a little beach time with my family, and we're spending the kind of latter half of our Italian trip here in the hills in Umbria. We've got a little pool, everything. It, it's quite nice. Um, unfortunately, at full disclosure, I'm not riding in Italy, which is a, a bit of a shame, but I 
couldn't find the luggage space for helmet, shoes, kit, everything. When you travel with a two-year-old, there's just a lot of stuff you need to bring. But I don't regret it too much, I have to say, because it's been 37 degrees every day here. And recall last episode, I threw the summer into the canal saying that extremely hot weather riding was was completely not enjoyable. And I, I just don't know how people do it in Italy in this climate. And to be fair, I haven't seen a lot of cyclists on the road. And, you know, Umbria around where I am right now, it's kind of picture perfect roads for, for cycling, very nice pavement, incredible scenery, beautiful hills, long climbs, but never too steep. So it would be sort of perfect, but I'm not really seeing any cyclists. And to be fair, the only ones I've seen are they look pretty old overall. The the people that I've seen and their kits aren't really up to date, I would say. So I'm sure that recreational Italian cyclists have a lot of style. I just haven't seen them on this trip so much. But again, to be fair, it's extremely hot. And I don't think people are venturing out on the road um, in this uh, massive European heat wave right now. What I'm hearing of all this stuff is that you didn't hire a porter to come with you and your luggage uh, on this trip. You, you sounds like you carried your own luggage, which limited you. I find that very, very, um, it's very poor planning on uh, my part. disheartening. It's very disheartening that you didn't hire a porter to carry your, uh, your, your, your Louis Vuitton cases uh, filled, filled to the brim with outfit choices as well as cycling choices. I would wager to say it's even off brand for us to not hire a porter. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't go anywhere without a porter. I would have hoped that Le Club would have hooked me up with a, a porter in uh, in Europe for my cycling uh, kit, but unfortunately, they did not. We'll have to discuss that with them. If we have any Italian listeners, get in touch. Let us know wh- what kit people are wearing on the road in Italy, because I've again, I've only seen maybe two or three riders in the last uh, 10 days or so they look to be above 60 shout out to our 60 and above listeners out there they look to be above 60 and their kits were not exactly you know the most recent or or the the coolest i would say uh, that i have seen so that that's it now speaking of speaking of cycling kit controversial takes that we've uh, we've dished out in the past few weeks I can't remember. Was it Warren or Tony who threw Lacol into the canal? It was one of you two. I can't remember who it was. I, did I throw them into the canal? Was that it? I, I have to remember. I mean, I, I I had a kind of a rant about them and and who they are. No, it was a listener asked you to throw her husband into the canal because For he wears wearing Lacol. Lacol. Yes, that's correct. And and so I kind of had a rant question. I mean, I don't like this. I don't like the style of it. But then I'm also sort of just questioning to me, they sort of came out of nowhere and seem to have a lot of money backing it considering sort of, you know, the, the pros that they've been associated with and, and how much kind of push they've had. And I just I just sort of was curious where it's all coming from. And they made that terrible Bora Hans Grohe kit for the 2022 Tour de France. But we got an email from a Lacol fanboy out there in the wild and Warren carried out a deep analysis of that email. Well, let's Warren, let's first of all, give him some respect for his passion about something. Cause I mean, yeah, part of, you know, part of we, we're doing this is we have a lot of, a, a lot of passion about brands we care about and think that think that are, are, are nice for, for various reasons. And we even argue with friends of ours who who will listen to the podcast and, and don't agree with our take on certain brands when we're really really praising them. Oh yeah, no. It, first of all, we appreciate the any messages we get, so it's not like we're going to say, "How dare this guy challenge our opinions?" I, I wasn't. I feel like Tony was worried I wasn't going to go that way. I wasn't at all. It was just interesting to get a different perspective. Didn't have his real name, which is going to add to maybe uh, kind of Tony's curiosity about who's back. I mean, he, did, he did say he was Lacole. not affiliated with the brand, and then yeah, no yeah. real name. It's it's John Lacole, the owner of it, or something. <laughs> there, there's no there's no quicker way to make me think you are associated with the brand than to say you aren't. Anyway, he said he'd listened to the last two podcasts and was wondering what was behind the bashing and attacks on Lacole. Says it, he says we sound a bit nasty and not controversial, uh, which I do want to clarify. It is not our intention to come across as nasty, so maybe we're a bit too harsh. The reality is, we simply, or I don't think any of us really care for the aesthetics of the brand. He did say the cynic in him wonders if it's our way of trying to get free kit. And I will state for the record, it is 100% not 
an attempt to get free kit. I don't want free LaCole kit. Do not send it to us. I will send it back. I, listen, I get it. And again, I love the passion. This is probably what he's got. But, you know, we're the authorities on it. You should listen to us. But at the same time, sort of like like what you like. Like when I was visiting Albion, and we were talking about spats. And you know I hate spats. I think it's awful. But like some people just love it. Whether And some people are kind I, of I like not only from like its practicality. They were talking about the kind of the look has sort of caught on because of the kind of gorp course popularity and so people love spats and stuff and like i can sit here saying it looks so bad and blah, 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 but if you if you think spats works for you and it's great so if you like lacal like i will ride with you and i won't trust your wheel but like good like i i i, I like what you like now again some of this has to, so, so, i also want to say that he sort of he criticized us for not doing research which is a, an explicit part of this podcast is that research is limited and it's a hot take podcast not a fact podcast but so we did some research and it was started by uh, a, a British pro. Okay, that gives some pedigree. But again, going back to my kind of financial question, it says they own their own factory in Italy. Now, that's big. Like to own your own cycling manufacturing factory. Like we, you know, we've, we, we've talked to a lot of brands, whether they've been interviewed on the podcast or DMs or emails or whatever, and, and sort of where they've been. And not many, basically none own their own factories. Right, most of them are, are 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 out of a sort of a, a you know a large scale factory, and they're going in and trying to kind of you know finesse their particular um, their particular brand. So this again, it it does bring up a bit of a question. Like I see, you know, I looked at the R story, and I see that, and I think like where like that's some good money. So someone's backing this. That's all I want to know. Who's backing this? Maybe it's this guy who sent us the email. Maybe he's the coal backer. This email was definitely from. Nigel Lacall or whomever owns Lacall and Warren started the rumor last podcast that Target owns Lacall as a Walmart rival and maybe Nigel Lacall is the secret owner of Target. So maybe this guy's the CEO of Target. This person did encourage us to try various pieces of Lacall and I responded back saying you know I thanked him for the feedback blah 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 and I did say, you know, if I could find LaCole at a decent price, I would try it. I have to admit to you, dear listener, that was a lie. I'm not going to do that. Uh, I'm not spending my money on LaCole. Yeah, I, I mean, I think also sometimes, and it's not the brand's fault, and this is this is the elitist in me. This is the sort of longtime cyclist in me. We we know that there's been a boom of cycling in the last couple of years. And the people I see wearing LaCole, it's like kind of obvious they're new. And part of that is so so, so there, there's a snobbishness to me that goes well i guess it's the new people have sort of picked up on it that's probably not a very good brand right like it's not it's not sort of niche enough and elite right like it's it's not that kind of uh, you know i heard about this before you hipster stuff that 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 i think goes hand in hand with with cycling and gatekeeping and all the important parts of cycling i would describe lacole as kind of like the new rafa core line you know it's like a lot of people have found it because of all the Strava discounts, it's priced, you know, somewhat accessibly. So now it's it's Lacor should be their name. Rafa Core line was great for a long time, though. It could have been your go-to bibs. You didn't ask any questions. You went straight to Rafa Core bibs, bought like four pairs of black bibs, two pairs of navy bibs, and you were set for life, right? It kind of went downhill over the years but that that's not exactly a knock on the code warren if you call them the rafa Corlon. it's more the ubiquity is what i'm referring to we had someone send in and he called the the which is ironic you know because the white band's been iconic in rafa but i guess it seems that um the way the core line has done is kind of the most obvious that, that 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 white band was like the 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 symbol of new cyclists right like if he saw a cycle you know wearing that rafa core with the white armband on the left it was kind of the like symbol and so i think that's the kind of warren's getting at is that like yeah rafa corline's been great and, and i think it's a it, you know all this stuff is good starter stuff but i think look cole kind of it signifies you know you, every brand sort of signifies a certain type of rider right and i think also with the way this this guy talked a lot about the performance of it and i mean i appreciate that he's a listener or they are she they are a listener i, I don't think that they we, we found who, who exactly this is but they should know that performance does not matter. Like we talk shit about ASOS and 
from what I understand, like they are an incredible brand. Like the the stuff they make is incredible. The quality, the performance, the R and D behind it. But I I just hate it. I hate what I I hate what it looks like. So I don't wear it. But it doesn't mean it's a shit brand. And it's kind of the same thing with Lacole. Like when I was reading, that, I was thinking, you know, good for him defending it. He really likes it, and I'm sure we'd probably get some probably some. People, you know, stop listening to us once we talk shit about assholes. That's what we're, we're we're here for the looks. Now, some there's some great brands out there that are that are sort of mixing the performance and the looks. But if you don't got the looks, man, we're not there for you. Tony, this got me thinking. I think we should start a segment called "Tell Me What Kit You Wear." I'll tell you who you are, basically. And people tell us what their cycling wardrobe is, and we're going to reverse engineer their personalities, their professional background, their various idios- idiosyncrasies from their cycling kit. And obviously you've just done the Lacol guy. Who is the Lacol guy? He's a new rider who joined cycling during the pandemic, et cetera. He's, he's quite fit. Like he started on Peloton, moved to Zwift, quite fit, has one other friend that's like really into it, probably a triathlete that said, yeah, you got to get a bike. You got to go outside, you know, um, so yeah, I think we could do this, right? We can definitely, you know, we definitely know what the Q36.5 rider is. Uh, so I think this is a great segment, uh, you know, yeah. so starting now, send us kind of maybe just sort of a, uh, a, a brief detail of your kit and we'll, yeah, sort of guess what your, what would be the BAU, the behavioral analysis unit for, for that. And maybe we'll even try and guess, guess your bike. Well, guess what we, we don't send us your bike. We'll guess what bike you have th- to go along with that kit what kind of bike does a, a lacole person ride because i know what my answer is it's a trek isn't it oh i was gonna say cervello yeah well tr- trek or cervello because it's because it's like they're not they're not the level where they're like buying like a pinarello dogma or something like super so it's like yeah it could be a yeah i think i think that's probably pretty good cervello i feel like it could be like a trek but like a tr- trek demone or something maybe like still kind of like feeling their way in i was gonna say a specialized tarmac with mechanical Altegra or something like that. The, the sort of Starbucks of, of cycling, the most basic kind of bike you can get nothing bad about it. Like pretty strong bike overall. You're, you won't go wrong with that, but nothing uh, earth shattering either. But also strong riders, like, like, like you're riding stuff, like, like these guys, these guys are strong. The call people, the call rider is a strong rider right? Lots of training focus, maybe coming from a running background. That's why they're thinking running. I know it's kind of picked up a bit, but it's always their aesthetic is always very performance driven and running. So maybe they're coming from that and they heard Lacole is a top performance company. So they, maybe they come from a running background. They're fit. Uh, they're usually over 40. I think, I think that's kind of the call rider, but we can do that with every, we can do that with the Pan or Mal rider. I mean, that might be the easiest one. I don't think we need to go through every single brand right now but please do message us email us uh with the kind of kit brands you most prominently wear and we will uh we'll analyze you and and thank you to the uh um, secret emailer who sort of led us down this road to this new segment idea and again even though we haven't sort of uh rebuked our our take on the call we haven't given given a lot of credit we respect your uh, strong opinions and that uh, you're willing to say something and that obviously you listen. So uh, shout out to you, nameless man, woman. Okay, next segment, news releases where we take a look at new stuff that came up in the world of cycling design or cycling fashion. And this is the cycling dog days of summer when There's not much going on in terms of releases. Stuff has either been released in the winter or the spring, a little bit before the season or kind of earlier in the summer. Summer is well underway right now, so not much is coming out. And it's that sort of quiet period between the Tour de France and the Vuelta a España. So there's not much that's coming out from the world of pros either. But there is one release that caught our attention, not quite a release, because we have seen this bike on the roads of the Tour de France. In fact, it is the bicycle that won the Tour de France this year, and it is the new Cervelo S5 from uh, obviously the brand Cervelo, Canadian brand Cervelo, which was released uh, more recently to the general public. And again, that is after Team Jumbo Visma has been trotting out this bike on the roads of France and winning the both actually the green jersey 
the yellow jersey and the polka dot jersey at the Tour de France, so really dominating the Tour de France on this bicycle. So let me describe the Cervelo S5 a little bit and we will give our take on it. Um, Cervelo describes the enhancements to the S5, which is a model that's been going on for quite a while from Cervelo. They describe this as a rather quiet enhancement to the previous iterations of the model. So the changes are relatively subtle. They've got a deeper frame section, they've got a new fork, and they have more tire clearance, which is definitely a trend that you see in road bike design across the board. Everybody wants to run 28s or even larger in some cases, and so bikes are coming out with more clearance. One thing that is definitely caught my attention when looking at that bike was this integrated stem, which I'm not even sure you can call this a stem anymore. It, it looks like a fork actually. So it's a fork on a fork and it's got sort of a three point system there holding your, your handlebars. It's got a triangle if you look at it from above. And another thing that's interesting looking at the Cervelo S5 is in terms of the seat stays. So we always rag on dropped seat stays. I won't do it again. This one also has dropped seat stays. But not only does it have drop seat stays, but when the seat stays meet that vertical rear tube, that tube curves, sort of um, hugging the, the shape of the wheel, so to speak, uh, creating an ellipse there. The bike that has been released in photos by Cervelo and by our good friends at Cycling Tips is a matte, bla matte black bicycle. So it's black on black on black, arrow seat post, Again, mad bike. The only thing that's not matte is probably the fork, which is more of a shiny black kind of carbon fork there. It's got disc brakes, and that is the new Cervelo S5 from the Canadian brand Cervelo. This retails as a complete build. If you're using Shimano Dura Ace, it would retail at 13,000 euros, which works out to... 13,000 US dollars and something like uh, 16 and a half or 17,000 Canadian dollars doing quick math in my head probably wrong but that is roughly what we're talking about what did you think about this one boys you know before this bike came out I might have thought we were unfairly ragging on Cervelo here and there because you know much like Lacole and some other I, I feel like we've made fun of Cervelo here and there and you know one of the very first bikes that was submitted for us to raid on the podcast maybe the very first was a Cervelo and uh I think one of our tips was the first thing was to repaint it so nobody would know it was a Cervelo anyway before this bike came out I would have said we are maybe being a bit unfair but after seeing this bike we are not being unfair this is this bike doesn't know what it wants to be it you know it wants to be aero it wants to be like a race bike. It wants to be sleek, but so it's matte black, but it also has a shiny fork for some reason. The triangle handlebars looks like it belongs on like a mini golf course. It looks like a whole, you know, one of those tunnels where you'd like hit your ball in and it goes through a pipe and comes out. I don't know why that made me think of that, but it does. I, I, I'm just speechless. I'm speechless. Are you currently riding the tour like that's the question you have to ask yourself and if the answer is no you should not ride or buy this bike like i i, I obviously see the the performance gains of it and i know the uci respects my view that a bike should look like a bike and that's where a lot of their rules come from but i i i, I can sort of get wanting to push certain performance boundaries in the race setting in the world tour setting considering how ugly this is and how much you're not going to get a bet, probably a really great benefit riding your local crit. Just don't buy it unless you're actually in the tour or I guess the Vuelta or whatever. You know what I mean? You're in the, you said you're in the world tour, you're a world tour pro. I don't want to see you riding this bike. Two questions from me. When are we going to stop with mad black bikes? It has to stop. It has been all mad black bikes from the big brands, be it Trek, Cervelo, Specialized, since about 2014, 15, it just keeps going. When is this going to end? Why are we 
aiming to look like a sort of military parade on, on a bike where being murdered out black bikes. I, I don't get it. I like a shiny black bike, a, a glossy black bike. I think that's a classic look. But the matte black bike, why do you want to look like a guy in a Porsche Cayenne with the matte? you know, the mad paint on the car. I just don't get it. Like the, this needs to end. That's number one. Number two, what was wrong with traditional STEM design that is making brands experiment with these extremely ugly stems? Now, there's been many different iterations of ugly stems. One of them has been the kind of integrated stems that we've seen pop up in the last three or four years that always end up looking extremely bulky and like you have a stack on your stem, basically. Even when they're slammed, they're just so thick that they look like they have a stack. So they have a pretty decent drop from the seat to the stem, but the stem is so bulky that it looks like you're trying to prop up your stem to improve your, your comfort on the bike and it ends up being kind of the opposite of what you want, which is to look slammed, number one. And number two, Cervelo now coming out with this triangular opening on you know between the handlebars and the overall bike which i'm not even sure i can call it a stem but it serves the function of a stem it's extremely ugly why are companies ramming these weird stem designs down our throat we were never asked if we wanted new stems you know no one ever sort of came out and said hey a traditional stem is ugly please improve it no it was fine it was perfect you could slam it it was easy you could do the adjustments yourself i don't understand why this is happening i mean obviously we know what was wrong with traditional stems is they weren't aero enough and you know they're making all these for the pro peloton but to tony's point you know you are not riding the pro peloton the people buying this bike you are not doing that so why do you need this horrifically ugly stem uh, that's going to save you X number of watts when you're going 60K an hour because you're not going to be going 60K an hour. Even in the pro tour, I would ask the question, Jonas Vingegaard won the tour on this bike and wearing that horrific Yumbo jersey and Mariana Voss is currently in yellow. Mariana Voss, who is also on Yumbo Visma, is currently in yellow for the Tour de Femmes in that same horrific jersey. My question is, if you win the tour on this bike and also in that jersey, but specifically you win this tour on the bike, is it really worth it to be seen on this bike? Sure. You won the tour, but you had to ride this like absolutely horrific bike. I'm going to, I'm going to give the pro Peloton here a pass and, you know, cause they are able to go 60 and save the three Watts over 45 minutes at whatever. But like for the recreational cycles that are, bu that's buying this stuff, First off, worrying about performance as as old people that we are, as 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 people you know, men of a certain age, we shouldn't be worried about. We should worry about beautiful bikes. But anyways, if you, if you do think I want to be faster, just train. There's a guy that Warren and I are friends with, and he is so strong, and he typically rides like a steel Omo with I think actually still has like a quill stem and mechanical and rim brakes, and he would rip like like. Like if if you're saying yourself like I need to be faster, guess what? Then you gotta train more. If you're a recreational cyclist, if you can't get those those benefits that that the pros are getting, we're, ride a beautiful bike and then just train a little bit more because you'll catch up to those extra three watts by an extra half hour on the trainer or you know uh, a, a couple less pizza slices. So let's you know we let's let's not think you need this bike. You need a bike of these performance and some of all the aero gains and this. Yeah, no, nah. maybe aero bikes are like the crash diets of cycling. It's like oh, I'm going to get these, you know, I'm not going to train to get these aero gains. I'm just going to spend $15,000 on this really ugly bike. It's sort of like, you know, the crash diets like, oh, I can just, you know, starve myself for three days to lose weight instead of just, you know, exercising regularly and eating a bit better. Are we throwing this bike in the canal? Yeah, 100%. Fully. There you go. New Cervelo S5 officially in the canal. Okay, next segment, the Panache Police the hot button issues and cycling the important debates and as i said earlier this is the cycling dog days of summer there's not much going on 
So we really bring you the hard hitting questions here on the Panache Police. And the, and the debate today that we are going to discuss is throughout the summer, do you work on maintaining your cyclist tan as the summer goes along and as it sometimes becomes harder and harder to maintain it as you do things like going to the beach or carry out other activities than cycling and you can't maintain those perfect tan lines on your arms and on your legs. So guys, what do you do there? We've, we've had the leg shaving you know, debate another time. How do you go about the tan issue? Do you try at all costs to maintain those perfect tan lines? No. I think that the tan line is a, is a great sign of who you are. Cyclist so goes very similar to the leg shaving. Uh, when you've got that, that sort of tight, crisp tan line, it, it's, it's, a, it's an indicator and it's kind of, you know, the, the, the lighter your, your skin that was under the, under the bibs in the Jersey versus the exposed skin it sort of shows how many K's you've put in. But at the same time, it, you can't guarantee that I respect it. So I have a friend uh, and his dad who's, who's quite a bit older uh, this was a couple of years ago, he had just the crispest cycling tan, like just, just, just like perfect. Right. And, 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 you know, dark golden Brown on the, on the exposed parts and, and pasty Celtic white on the, on the, on the, you know, parts with, with kit. And I thought, man, this guy, you know, and he's, he's older, he's pushing 80. He's on, he must be in the saddle constantly. And so I was mentioning it to my brother, who's actually better friends with this friend uh, spent spent a little more time over sometimes at their house hanging out and stuff. And he said, no, nah, he barely rides. He just sits in his backyard wearing his kit. <laughs> and so, so I was like, so what, what do you mean? Like he's not putting in, you know, 300 K 300 K a week. No, nah, I rides for like 20 minutes on a Saturday or something, but then goes, goes back, cracks a few beers and sits there. So ever since then, I was like the respect for it. I've kind of lost and I like it. You can say, Oh, you're a cyclist. You've got this, but it, it might not be as good of a signifier as, as some people would hope it, hope it is. And then also even cyclists, we're obsessed. We're, we're nuts. We're, you know, ragging on brands and talking stuff and all the shit that this podcast is, but Still enjoy your life. If you're going to go, if you're, if you're on the med and you don't have a bike and you want to be tarp off walking around uh, it's in a Speedo and it just ruins your tan, enjoy your life. So I'm not, I'm not hardcore on that. Uh, I don't, I don't try and maintain it. I, you know, you, I usually get a pretty solid one just because most of my outdoor activity in the summer is cycling and I, and there's nothing in the world that will get me to wear a sleeveless jersey. So Mine's always pretty good, but I don't think you've got to you've got to hold on to that thing uh, too tightly. I might be opening up myself to criticism by saying this, but I've noticed a lot of um, different brands, their bib shorts, even the ones that they're going longer, a lot of their lengths are different. So I'm finding I have these like different lines of tan on my legs, depending which brands I wear on the Neapolitan. Yeah. And you know, if I had one thick, like very clear contrast with one clean line, then maybe I would want to preserve it. But the fact that it's all, yeah, the Neapolitan, I'm not too worried about, you know, preserving that. And, you know, maybe our listeners might be listening and be like, what, he doesn't wear the exact same bib blanks on every ride to get that clean tan. Cause I think there's, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised that there, if there's people out there who do consciously do that with both bibs and jerseys, because that's the same problem with jersey sleeves these days is the lengths are a little like inconsistent, even the longer ones. So yeah, I'm with Tony. I, I like the cycling tan. I like kind of like the fact that you can sort of notice it when I'm in a t-shirt or like short sleeve button up. And it's not like I won't go swimming or like I'll only swim in like a shirt or a jersey to ensure, you know, my core isn't isn't going to stay as as pasty white as uh, Jonas Vingergaard. As Tony said, live your life. It's just a tan. It'll go away over winter, and then it'll come back next year. I used to be almost religious about the cycling tan. I would do everything I could to maintain it. Uh, I used to rent a, a cottage by a lake in the Laurentians in Quebec, and when I would go swim. I'd go for the swim, and as soon as I'd come out, I'd put on a T-shirt right away to make sure that my core wasn't getting too tan and that my arms would continue to get the tan. It was getting a little bit sick when you think about it. And then 
you know, this year, as I mentioned at the outset of the podcast, I'm I'm in Italy and I've been spending some time on the beach in, in Sardinia. And I actually noticed something really interesting, not necessarily cycling related, but it's it's one thing that led me to drop the cycling tan for this year and to adopt a more generalized body tan. And it's a phenomenon that I would call the Euro tan. And Europeans just seem to have a very different relationship with the sun than we North Americans do. And this has been really interesting because I don't know what's up in Italy this year, but there are very few North Americans that you see among tourists. I'm not sure if this is some remnants of, of the pandemic that is preventing people from from traveling to, to Europe. But the people that I've That's seen... That's not what Instagram's telling me. No, probably not. But what I've seen anyway in, on the beaches of, of uh, Costa Smeralda in, in Sardinia is I would say about 80% Italians, maybe 10% Germans, and 10% Brits. Now, the Brits are easy to spot on the beach because they're mostly of a pink color. But even the Germans, they're, they're almost like the Italians in that they are, you know, dark brown colored. And people don't seem to be wearing sunscreen very much. They just go straight up for that sun exposure. And we actually ran out of sunscreen as a family this year. So we went to a pharmacy in Italy to buy some. And it seems like none of these European sunscreens work, really. Like they're all, they all have great packaging, all have great marketing, but they just don't work, basically. They don't protect you against the sun. And it, it, yeah, it just feels like people here don't care. So you see these Italian nonni, like the 80-year-old guys, and they've got like thick brown leathery skin because they just spend all their time in the sun. And so I showed up there in Sardinia looking really, really pale with my cycling tan. And I thought, eh, you know what? I think I'm going to go for the Euro tan this year. And I've, you know, still in a relatively safe way with sunscreen and all that. Unfortunately, with European sunscreen, that doesn't work that well. But I have adopted a more generalized tan this year. So I've relaxed a little bit about it. But I used to be more religious about it. But I, I think I'm going to have to agree with you guys. This has maybe gone too far in terms of, um, you know, obsessive compulsive disorder of cycling fashion week if you're not wearing shorts to show off the 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 bib tan then the non-cyclist just thinks you've got some sort of like crazy farmer tan like you you're working like you're a landscaper nothing wrong with that i was I used to do landscaping it can be an okay summer job but like i'm just saying like if you're trying to sort of like signify to the rest of the world that like this is what you do similar to the leg shave like oh why is your tan like that like it, it needs you need to also be wearing shorts so that they can be like oh you have really these really extreme tan lines and you'd be like, well, I'm a cyclist and I spend, you know, seven hours on a Saturday out on the bike wearing this. I definitely have lost the, uh, the need to feel that has to be there, but I'm still very strong into leg shaving. And I, and I, and I really actually, that's a question, Alex, you said this was going to be your first year of, of some sort of leg hair removal. Did you ever do it? I haven't done it yet, but, uh, maybe I'll, I'll break it out to our listeners. We, we have a big episode coming up live from the club with special guests that have come from the other side of the world to come to meet with us in Montreal. Tony and Warren are going to be traveling to Montreal. We've got some events planned, maybe a little group ride, maybe a little live recording here and there. And I promise that I will remove my leg hair for this specific episode. I was going to say you have to shave your legs, Tony, and I don't want to be seen with you if you're not going to show up yeah. with the... Uh... With hair on your legs. We'll get Italian Alex to come and pretend he's you. Well, I don't know if he can do that, although he probably has a better tan than I do. Hey, what are you doing? I don't know, I'm just fucking tossing bites in the river, bro. Okay, next segment, the flagship segment, Into the Canal, where we throw something from the world of cycling or cycling fashion, cycling culture that we absolutely hate, Into the Canal, the alternative of... A canal is a camillien, which is something that we really like from the world of cycling fashion. So, guys, I'll start this week. I got nothing to throw in the canal this week. Life's good. I'm in Italy. I was in Sardinia. been eating, you know, wonderful seafood pasta every day with crisp white wine. Then I went to Umbria. I had some wild boar ragu, some truffle ravioli with some incredible wines as well, enjoying the, the views, the hills from the pool. So I got nothing for the canal. Things are good. I'm, I'm happy. 
I'll I'll stick on the uh, the positives because I got a chameleon this this week, uh, not a not a canal, uh, and that is chains, necklaces, whatever you want to call them, uh, with or without pendant. But like, I just think it's a great look. I just you know you catch me climbing up Ellis Avenue, the hardest climb in Toronto. Just hot day, jersey open, gold chain, just dangling, no base layer, and it just looks amazing. I've noticed more and more cycles with chains. I mean, it's a classic sort of thing. I love the sort of bulky gold, but but whatever you've got, uh, I think actually on the ride that we went in, Warren and I went on on Sunday, he was the only one without a chain. It was a little bit disappointing. But uh, yeah, I'm chameleon chains. I love it. Get your cross, whatever your star of David, you know, can be anything. You can go no pendant, you know, go, go with like the Williams brothers and get the six mil Cuban link. I think the chain is a great look. Actually, Tony, I have a cam- I have a chameleon as well. Just get your, your chain take got me thinking about Hugo Ull, Quebec rider who won a Tour de France stage in the last week of the tour and the reason why i say chains kind of got me thinking about that was because he wears a chain with a little cross to remember his brother who was killed the year that he turned professional and as he crossed the finish line in first place he kind of took that chain and took the cross and and kind of sent it up to the sky so it was an incredible moment actually to to watch this on on the tour so anyway just a little segue from your chain take and huge moment for Canadian cycling. Uh, first time since 1988, I believe, a, a Canadian uh, won a stage. Yeah, first time since Steve Bauer, I believe. You mentioned our ride, our gravel ride. Italian Alex was wearing a chain that, I don't know, was about as big as the kind you probably put on your tires in the winter. But I have to say, like, you know, I'm not really a big jewelry guy. I, I can't really hate on it. It, it does kind of work. And especially Italian Alex also has a lot of chest hair. So I think that just like, Oh, it's Good. it's a boon for him. I mean, he's got to yeah. sell it going, right? And so again, you got the jersey open, hot day. He he's obviously a good Catholic boy, so he's got the 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 crucifix with Christ on it, and it's it, it's thick gold. I don't know, probably got it at communion or something. It's a deep. It's like an eighteen karat, twenty four karat, like a real rich gold, and it just sort of hangs hangs down. Mine's a little more subtle, but I just still love it. I love it. And I, and I yeah, I, I was, as I was saying, that was like, like I said, thinking of the Williams brothers and they do the Cuban links, which I, I can't pull off. I'll admit, but I'm sure there's a lot of people who could pull off the Cuban links. And then that's nice. Shout out to Italian Alex. What do you got for us, Warren? You know, it's funny. We didn't plan this, but I also have a chameleon. We, we didn't plan to be all positive this week. This is this. I think this is the first time in cycling fashion week history that all of us have something positive to say. Nothing's in this going in the canal. Now, to be fair, we did throw the Cerve- Cervelo S5 in the canal. But yeah, that's uh, true. other than that, on the actual segment, so. we're all positive. Part of it was getting that email from that person about LaCole, and they were saying our takes were kind of nasty, and I got a bit self-conscious. And so I wanted to show that there are things we like. And this isn't really the same thing, because Tony was talking about something aesthetic. And Alex is talking about something pretty poignant. For me, this is actually something relating to practicality, somewhat related to fashion. Vaguely, I'll explain in a bit. But for me, Chameleon is using a reusable uh, plastic flask and filling it with maple syrup on rides rather than eating gels. Specifically on like in events or races, I think it really comes in handy. There's a couple gel brands out there, one of them is untapped, that is basically just maple syrup and like salt and a bit of ginger. And I forget where I read about this, but somebody just suggested using pretty small reusable flask. You can buy them. I got mine from this like big Canadian sports store online. And it's actually, I think, for running. And yeah, I just fill it with maple syrup, put a tiny bit of salt, a few drops of water to dilute it a little bit. And yeah, it's basically the same as having gels. It carries more. It's less messy because you don't have to rip it open every time and maybe get gel on your hand. It's tied to fashion in that sense is you're keeping your hands and your kit clean by using that. And you can also pretend that you care about the environment and tell people it's because you don't want to waste plastic and blah, blah, blah. But I actually just actually think it's a much more enjoyable experience than eating actual gels. And it's basically all the same. Like, sure, there's no caffeine in it, but whatever. That's my positive thing. Not quite as positive as you two guys, but 
it's still positive. I mean, I think first we we don't have to tie everything to cycling fashion. Where as Alex pointed out many episodes ago, we're also part of the cycling culture, so that's part of the kind of the culture of the pod. You know, the culture of it. we're not. You know, it's a bit about performance, but but I think it's it's close enough to just the kind of culture of it. I think it's a great idea. Uh, I love maple syrup. I recommend our listeners give it a try because of sustainability reasons, not because it's cheaper and easier. <laughs> Okay, our last segment today, We Rate Your Bike for Free. It's the return of We Rate Your Bike for Free. Very simple concept. You send us pictures of your bike via DM on Instagram at Cycling Fashion Week or via email cyclingfashionweek at gmail.com. Little description, little story behind the bike. And we will rate your bike, as the title suggests, for free here on the podcast and give you some constructive criticism and constructive feedback as to how to improve the look of your bike which you should be grateful for since we are the global cycling style authority here on cycling fashion week so the submission this week comes to us from sandra from toronto canada and sandra the only thing that sandra said she sent us the pic and she said i have wide bar tape now haha or i'm not even sure if it said haha at the end but it said i have wide bar tape now so let me do a quick little description of the bicycle i think we are talking about a canyon ultimate here it is uh the uh, road bike from canyon uh the german direct consumer brand uh i say it's the canyon ultimate initially i thought it was the canyon air road but then i remembered that the air road has dropped seat stays and this canyon ultimate does not in fact have dropped seat stays it has regular seat stays, and I want to commend Sandra for opting for a bike with regular seat stays. If there is one contribution to the world of cycling style that Cycling Fashion Week could have, which would make us very happy, it would be to kill drop seat stays forever. So congratulations, Sandra, on this one. I'll describe the rest of the bike. The bike is an interesting light blue color. It's light blue, but it's not baby blue. It's not like the, the blue that you find on the Finnish flag or on the Quebec flag. It's, it's somewhere between light blue and purple or lavender color, so to speak, but still more on the blue spectrum there. Um, so very interesting color on this Canyon road bike. Uh, as Sandra said in her message, she has, so this is interesting. She's got black tires, so all black tires, so no tan sidewall she's got a black seat post a black saddle a black saddle bag a black stem black everything on the on the group set actually but she's got kind of poppin white bar tape which i'm sure will elicit much discussion here this is a rim brake bike so again congratulations to sandra for riding a rim brake bike because it's just the fact that rim brakes look better than disc brakes the group set appears to be ultegra if i'm not mistaken this looks like an ultegra crank um it's got one of these integrated stems that we talked about earlier that looks a little bulky i'm going to say but maybe that's something that could be improved as part of the constructive criticism and kind of interesting bottle cages that are shaped like an x when you look at them from the side, it's pretty bulky saddle bag as well. I have to say an Evoque saddle bag. One quick piece of advice I, I would give you, Sandra, would be to slim down the saddle bag. This is a road bike. You probably don't need that much stuff in your saddle bag. Maybe, you know, an extra tube, a couple of tools, tire levers, and then you're all set. Everything else you can put in your jersey back pockets. Uh, so maybe slim down the saddlebag would be my advice i'll i'll let the guys comment on it I'll, I'll get back later with my final rating on this bike from sandra but that's it canyon ultimate from sandra in toronto i, I mean i think we just got to get out of the way slam the stem that's uh you know that's that's advice for everyone that's that's something we'll just kind of constantly say but these new stems are hard to slam tony they're very hard to slam they're hard to slam i mean you can you can see from the photo that even she slammed it that the way the stem is you have quite a rise but she could still, she still got some spaces there. She could slam it, uh, you know, get that back hurt. Um, I've always felt canyons in terms of the kind of more sort of performance road bike. Cause you know me, I'm a sort of a steel classic round two guy obsessed steel, titanium, aluminum, but I'm not really into carbon. I've always felt Canyon did do the sort of best job of, 
of bringing in the 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 arrow sort of look while kind of maintaining a bit like at least in this ultimate here kind of maintaining a bit more of the kind of classic shape so shout out to that uh love the light blue the bottle cages i don't actually don't know what they are we should have asked but uh, i think they're great uh she so got the 500 mil bottle there the white bar tape uh i think the bar tape has to match a saddle i'm sorry i know you're excited about your white bar tape but maybe you just maybe keep the white bar tape and just go for a white saddle i mean and i think i think actually the white and the blue would go really well together um, but again, I've got to give it a 10 out of 10 because she has the, uh, the front in the little chain ring. And like I said before, I don't care about that rule. Uh, and so I think that's amazing. I like that she did that. Um, so it's a 10 out of 10, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff. I think Alex is right a little bit about the saddlebag, slam the stem. Every time we're probably going to tell you that if the stem's not slammed and maybe, uh, maybe get a, a white saddle as an option and you can kind of switch out as you switch your bar tape. Uh, but overall, it's a 10 out of 10 for not following the uh, big ring chain rule. I actually want to start by talking about the bottle cages because I think bottle cages are often an overlooked accessory on a lot of bikes. Not all of them. I, I know a lot of you put some serious thought into your bottle cages, but some people don't. Some people have very nice bikes and then like an elite bottle cage. You probably know the one I'm talking about. It's just like this really basic, ugly one. So I, I don't know what brand these are. We may have to follow up with her and, and ask what they are. I really like them too. Uh, they sort of have this like little X look from the side. They look really minimal. Um, I think they fit the profile of like a kind of racier bike really well. I think her wheel depth is like perfect, uh, like deep, but not too deep. I really like the color blue on this frame. Like it's, it's not Navy and it's not sky blue. It's kind of like in between. I don't, is it like an ocean blue? I'm not sure. Uh, I, I don't know that this color blue really works for me. Another thing about the white bar tape is it's just kind of a, it's a risky choice. This is a road bike, so a bit safe, but like that's going to get dirty pretty fast. And, you know, and I understand the, having the colored bar tape, I've dabbled with that a bit myself, not on my road bike, but my first cross bike many years ago was like orange and black. And at one point I had orange bar tape on the bike too. And it, one, it didn't last very long. I had to replace it pretty quick because it got so dirty. And, you know, and in retrospect, I, I think it was the wrong call on my part. But I will point out the bar tape matches the bottle. Maybe that's a whole area we haven't even explored yet is matching your bottle to parts on the bike. And and then the saddlebag, I, was, I, I agree. I was just going to make a few suggestions or not makes a really nice sleek uh saddlebag that tony and i bought i think towards the end of last year we each, we each bought one it's been great uh, and then there's also if you want to support more local company velo color canadian company makes a pretty sleek saddlebag as well so you got some pretty easy options to find something a bit sleeker and silker may have ripped off velo color so they also <laughs> make a pretty nice option they definitely did. Uh, they just put a bow on it. For my rating, I will give Sandra uh, a 7.1 out of 10. Yeah, I was going to give her also something like a 7.5 out of 10, which could go up to like an 8.5 if she corrected some of the issues that, that we mentioned, saddlebag, etc. Now, just a little bit more on the bar tape. Um, I'm not opposed to an all-white cockpit. In fact... If you go white stem, white saddle, and white bar tape, it's a very Euro pro look from, you know, Mape heydays. Or if you're riding a Colnago with an all-white cockpit, white saddle, that's a pretty cool Euro look that you have there. But I think you guys nailed it. Like, it's just when, when your saddle is black, you're stem is black your everything else is black but you're going with white bar tape it, it just feels like something's wrong there well, you know that just doesn't match everything else so seven and a half sandra for me sorry tony what was your rating tony uh, mine was a 10 but specifically because of the uh, small chain ring thing 10 and warren 7.1 so you know that averages to a pretty mm -hmm. good score overall sandra will post the bike on our instagram so listeners can weigh in as well we hope that our listeners will remain constructive as, as they always are. Our listeners are pretty, uh, pretty nice people overall and they're constructive from provide good comments. So hopefully this will, this is how it's going to go.
Okay, that's it for another episode of Cycling Fashion Week coming to you live from Italy. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Warren. As I mentioned earlier, we've got more Cycling Fashion Week coming up in the next few weeks. Some pretty big episodes coming up, interesting interviews, and also a sort of live event in Montreal that we've been teasing and that we'll tell you more about in the next few weeks coming up. Thank you to our sponsors at Le Club, leclub.cc. Check them out. They are your one-stop shop, your go-to destination for the best cycling apparels, the best brands that you can find. Albion, Universal Colors, Sweet Protection, Quark Shoes, Map. They've got everything. Fast shipping, very efficient people, very nice people over at Le Club. And we at Cycling Fashion Week are happy to hook up our listeners with a 15% friend discount when you go to leclub.cc, put in the code FASHIONWEEK15. Tell them that Alex, Warren, and Tony sent you, and they will take 15% off your order. Write us an email, cyclingfashionweek at gmail.com. Follow us on Instagram at cyclingfashionweek. Please leave us reviews on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. We always like to read those, especially when they're five-star reviews. Uh, but even if you don't rate us five-star, please leave some comments as we always get a laugh out of this. And that is it for us this week on Cycling Fashion Week. We'll see you in a couple of weeks from now. Take care. Chapeau, Hugo Hall.